Okay, once again, welcome everyone as we continue our study of Galatians. I apologize to people on the live stream if you were trying to find um, today is, of course, a holy day of obligation. So if you haven't gone to Mass yet, make sure you go to Mass. I was just covering um, one of the Masses across town. And as you can imagine, a lot of people there. So a little longer than usual, but very happy to delve back into. So for everyone that is following along, turn to your um, Galatians. Um, we are still, as you remember, relatively uh, early along, let's say, in the letter. Um, as we had a wonderful discussion last time. So we ended up right around uh, the beginning of chapter two. So if you're in Galatians, turn right around to the beginning of chapter two. Last week, we went through sort of the second portion of the first chapter. And you remember we had a great discussion about vocation. Why? Because this was the whole passage in which Paul is talking about his conversion. Remember we had the big talk about is it called conversion? Is it called something else? Do you remember the word that he uses that's so important when he talks about his, what happens to him? Revelation. Revelation. Perfect. Which is such a perfect thing, right? How he talks about his, you know, the famous story, right? About him on the road to Damascus on the horse, perhaps he falls off the horse. He has this, this vision, this revelation of Jesus, and that changes his whole entire life. It is a conversion experience as we talked about, because it turn what does conversion mean turning around turns completely around and now he becomes this great missionary of uh, the christian religion right away and that led to a nice discussion about our own vocations right how is it that we are called because we all have a, a heavenly calling right from god and how is it that revelation is a part of our vocation meaning god reveals himself to us in some way and how do we respond obviously as we talked about not everybody, we, we like to think we would like to have him appear to us, Jesus appear to us like he did to St. Paul. That'd be great, right? Because it would be so easy. But at the same time, we also talked about how, you know, the, to, to the one who more is given, uh, more is expected, right? So Paul does have this very miraculous revelation and vocation, but that means he's going to have that much more difficult of a, of, a, of a road ahead, right? Many of us, as we talked about, the way that God reveals our vocation to us is usually in a more silent, right? way um probably for you too deacon i didn't hear the beginning of your story but you know the, the lord speaks in, in 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 a small kind of voice still small voice as he did to the prophets in the old testament um it was nice last after last bible study because some of you came up and would said you know oh i do want to share my vocation story and you know talk about it because it is something that it's it's a personal thing so we don't necessarily want to put it out on the live stream but that's okay but it's good for each of us to reflect on you know what is my story how has the lord been revealing himself to me calling me in some way um, and how has he revealed himself to me? And how is that daily continuing? Obviously, because it's a daily call. So that was a great reflection last week. So we're going to jump to, um, we are going to jump to chapter two. Um, now we're getting into, today, we're really getting into the weeds in a certain sense. We're getting into the real heart of what this letter is about. Does anybody remember when we talked about the letter, I think it was two weeks ago when we introduced it, kind of what was the major issue that caused Paul to write this kind of very vehement letter to his people in Galatia. There was there was a situation where they were getting involved in something that wasn't too good. Does anybody remember what that was? They were listening to people who were trying to pervert the gospel and saying they had to follow all the Jewish customs. And yes. So here you got these Galatians, they're new Christians, and all of a sudden these other people come in who are also claiming to be Christian, and they say, oh, Paul told you to do that? Actually, you're supposed to do this. This is how you're supposed to follow the gospel. And in this case, what was the particular thing they were asking them to do is to follow the the Jewish uh, law into its, you know, to a T, meaning dietary customs, uh, circumcision is the big one, obviously, that could, that's going to come up today. So these people, we call them now Judaizers, meaning people who try to, Christians who try to impose the Jewish, the, the restrictions and the proscriptions of the Jewish law upon Christians. So these people came along, and as Paul says at the beginning of the letter, right, the Galatians kind of started to listen to them and they started to sort of what's the word we use to backslide a little bit in the sense that, you know, Paul had preached to them the gospel. And now these other people come preaching a different gospel, a perversion of the gospel, as he himself says. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, maybe they're right. Right. There's a little bit of backsliding. So now Paul is going to get into again. We just heard him defend his ministry. He's trying to tell them this is who I am. I am an apostle. This is why I have the authority to actually teach you the gospel and why my gospel actually has authority. And now he's getting into kind of, uh, again, the, the real matter at hand, which is what did the apostles, what did the early church decide as to this issue of as Christians, are we going to follow, you know, all the, the 613 commandments of the Old Testament? Are we? And what did the apostles decide and what 
how did that inspire his ministry? So let's get into it then. It's referred to, you might have, your heading might say the Council of Jerusalem. Um, this is kind of what that period was referred to, what that kind of meeting or conference was referred to. We refer to it as a council. It wasn't one of the ecumenical councils, um, but it was a council in the sense that the apostles came together to make some decisions, as we're going to talk about, as to are we going to follow these, these Jewish laws and commandments. So does somebody want to read... Um, Verses 1 and 2. This is, again, chap chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also with me. And I went up according to Revelation and communicated to them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but apart to them who seem to be some thing. Least perhaps I should run or had run in vain. Very good. So it's it's great how he just kind of glosses over 14 years. So long period <laughs> after 14 years. Then I went back up to Jerusalem. So this is his second journey to Jerusalem. As you saw in verse 18, just a little bit before he went up to Jerusalem after three years of being a Christian. So he's converted. He's already preaching. On his own, really, as we talked about last time, right? He's doing his own thing for the most part. He's not going to confer with the apostles. This is a revelation that was given to him by Jesus. After three years, he goes up to Jerusalem. This is verse 18. He talks with Peter and the other apostles. And he kind of gets, you know, the sense that, okay, we're together in this ministry, even though we're in different parts of the world. Then 14 more years, he's back doing his thing, right? Throughout uh, Syria, Cilicia, these are parts of like Asia Minor, of present day Turkey. So he's going all over for 14 years. Imagine that. So 14 years plus the three years before that, so this is, you know, almost 20 years that he spent just preaching the gospel, going to all these different communities, preaching the gospel, making many different converts. The Galatians for, is one example. The Thessalonians, as we talked about, you know, a couple months ago. Now he goes up for a second time, as we see in, in verse one of chapter two, to Jerusalem. He takes along his buddies here, Barnabas and Titus, some of the guys who had been with him in the journey. And we know that at this point, this is where kind of, again, the little bit of a, of a sort of a altercation is going to ensue. Why? Well, think about this. He's been almost 20 years. He's been preaching and doing his own thing for the most part. Now he's going to Jerusalem, which is what's Jerusalem in terms of for Christians, right, at this time. It's kind of a, it's, a, it's like the major site, right, in terms of it's where all the things of, you know, the events of Jesus' life happened. It's where a lot of the apostles and disciples are still remaining. So he's going really like to the central office in a certain sense. He's like, I've been I've been preaching around for 20 years. I'm going back to the central office the second time to kind of see what, you know, what they're doing and to see kind of how I fit into this whole picture. So as you can imagine, he's kind of setting the stage for there might be a little bit of a, um, you know, an altercation. But he says, what does verse two say? I went up in accord with the revelation. Again, this word revelation. Right. He's saying again, this is not me. Right. This is wasn't like I just did this because I wanted to go see what was going on. He said there was a revelation. You know, what does it say to us? It means that Paul was a very spiritual, mystical person. He was constantly he had to constantly be praying and be listening for that voice of revelation to speak to him, to tell him something like like the Lord says to him on his heart. You need to go up to Jerusalem. Right. You need to go consult with the other apostles. So this is from a revelation. And what does he do? He's going to present to them the gospel that I preach to the Gentiles. So again, what is he doing? He's saying, this is what I've been preaching for 20 years, almost 20 years to the Gentiles, to the nations. What, what do you think of it, basically? What, is, what, what are the, those men of repute, as he calls them? Um, what, what do you think of my gospel? What do you think of my ministry? So this is a big moment. He's coming. He's kind of bearing his soul to the powers that be in Jerusalem. And then he says, somebody want to read um, verse, let's do verse three through five. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Moreover, not even Titus, who was with me, although he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But because of the false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, that they might enslave us. To them we did not submit even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might remain intact for you. Mm. So already we can see kind of the battle lines being drawn in a certain sense. Why? So he's saying quite clearly here that Titus, his his buddy, right, who was a Greek, meaning he was not a Jew, he was not circumcised, 
he wasn't forced to be circumcised, meaning he wasn't forced to follow the prescriptions of the Jewish law to a T. So he's already saying this was not something that was expected in the early church. They were in Jerusalem. He was there. They didn't expect this of him. They didn't expect Paul and his followers to follow everything about the Jewish law. But because of the, anybody have false brothers or something else there, but because of the verse four, other yeah, translations, false brethren. false brethren, anybody else have a different, go ahead and shout it out if you. Christians who took the position that Gentile Christians must first become Jews for circumcision and observance of the Mosaic law in order to become Christians. Exactly. Which is, again, the Judaizers. Again, that people that think, people that were succumbing and saying, oh, well, you got to follow all the prescriptions of the Jewish law if you want to really be a Christian. And he refers to them as pretty harsh false brothers. I think it's an important term to reflect on. Why? Because he's saying there's people that, this is something for us to reflect on too, right? Like there's people in our community, there's people who are brethren who, you know, in a certain sense are trying to lead astray, whether by their own intention or whether simply by ignorance or whatever it might be. But he was saying that there was people in the community who were secretly brought in who were actually leading people astray by trying to, again, uh, force upon these new Christians all the prescriptions of the Jewish law, including, again, circumcision is the one that's probably the most, uh, you know, you know, yeah, the best example, because imagine that. <laughs> And imagine that. Imagine if you're Titus, like you, Titus was a was a convert. You know, Paul converts him. He's a he's a Greek, meaning he's he's not a Jew. You know, and he hears the message of Jesus, and he's so excited. Oh, this is great, wonderful! And then this guy comes up to him and says, "You have to be circumcised now." What? Like what? You know, like how would you even? You know, um, obviously we can think about it in that way. It's kind of funny, but um, but in a more uh, theological way, it's it's it would it's you know it's basically saying. What, and this is why, as we're going to see, Paul has such a problem with this. What is this saying? It's basically saying. The gospel is not enough. That's basically what it's saying. It's saying you're not saved just by you hear the word of Jesus, you believe in Jesus and all that kind of stuff. They're basically saying, no, that's not enough. You now have to do this. You have to do you have to be circumcised or you have to do this. They're adding something to what the gospel is all about. Right. And even I think a little bit more than that is that when the Jews would conquer other nations, they would force those people to be circumcised and make them Jewish as well, kind of enslaving them into their religion without a choice. So I think that's a big part of this as well, is are we treating these Gentiles the way we treat to conquered nations, or are they making a free decision to join the Church of Christ? Yes. The, actually, that's a great point. Free choice is a huge part of what Paul believes. This is what this whole letter is about, because many people think that Paul is just like, oh, the Jewish law is terrible, don't get circumcised, nothing, you know. Actually, that's not the case, you know. He obviously he was he was brought up as a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He, he very much appreciates the Jewish law. And actually, what does he come to? And later in this letter and other letters, what is his his kind of proposition? He says it's okay if if Christians want to continue, you know, to follow the Jewish law. That's okay if they want to, but they shouldn't be forced to. So he basically says, you know, if if, a, if there's a Jew who becomes a Christian and really has enjoyed the the Jewish law and all its commandments and is used to following them. He can continue to follow them if he would like to, so long as he doesn't think that that has to be imposed on other new Christians. So what does this all come back to? It comes back to free choice, right? That we have a choice. We as Christians, right? We don't believe in imposing, right? We believe in everybody has a free will, free choice, and therefore we can't force people to believe the gospel as much as maybe we want to. It kind of goes back to what De deacons I keep using your uh your image there of we love to be able to just go down Hill House Avenue and spray everybody with holy water and baptize everybody. Great. Everybody's baptized. Everybody's saved. But why can't we? Because there's no there's no choice. You know, there's no free choice. Yeah. Desire for the other person. Exactly. Well, can we touch on that? Yes. Aspect of freedom, because of uh, verse four, mm -hmm. he says that those brethren that came in and he makes the point that they in my says they came in secretly, mm. which means we all understand about you know, things we do in the darkness versus mm -hmm. things we do in the light. But he also said, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, mm. which we have in Jesus Christ. So I think he's reinforcing the point, like you mentioned, we're not taking <clears throat> people captive. We're sharing with them the freedom that we enjoy, and we want to willingly share that with them mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So the 
So to be bound by the Jewish laws, to be told you have to do that, takes away an element of that freedom. Exactly. And he wants them to be free to to experience what he's experienced. Yeah. And what the other Christians. Experience. Yeah. I think that's what that yeah. is trying to tell us. That's a yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Why are we most people circumcised now? That's a great question. <laughs> I imagine probably more for health. Yeah, health, health reasons, yeah. Health. yeah, yeah. Health and hygiene. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's it's probably one of those things we all say. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's probably changing too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though we're, yeah, but it's nice that you know, it's a, there's a big difference when you know if the age makes it. But you know, if you're if you're Titus and you're, can we move on? The if you're Titus and you're. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, it's a great point that Deacon made. Um, this is a big thing in Pauline theology, right? This whole, this dichotomy or this, you know, binary between freedom and slavery. Right. Like he keeps using that image, freedom bondage and slavery. Dark. Exactly. Freedom and, they use the word bondage, freedom and bondage, mm -hmm. even more. And the freedom is what characterizes us as Christians, right? Meaning we're not, uh, we're not beholden to anything or anyone except God alone, right? We're not beholden to. Right. And he doesn't even hold us in bondage either. He gives us freedom. Exactly. That's, you know, and unfortunately, in our world today, people may look at us and say, look at their, you know, they're tied, you know, they're slaves to, we're not slaves. Mm -hmm. We have God's freedom. Yeah. And we're not, that's the only thing that really is what binds us to God is the freedom that He gives us mm -hmm. and the freedom that we have in, in Him. Mm. Yeah, that's a big, I mean, I think this is something that probably us, many of us have thought about before. That's a big thing that's controversial about our faith in a certain sense is the idea of free will. Like this is, comes up a lot in the RCA class because people can't wrap their head around the fact that God would give us a free decision, you know, because they say to themselves, well, doesn't that mean that God knows that we could potentially choose against him? We could potentially sin. We could potentially commit grave acts of, you know, terror that happen in our world. And and the answer is, yeah. Right. And that's how much, you know, God respects our free will, that even if we are totally against him and even do really heinous things against him, he's he's like, you're, you're I gave you free will and I have to maintain that because he could have created us to be robots. But then there wouldn't have been there's no love when there's, you know, robot response. If it's a robot response that you have no choice and there's no true love there. Right. So he wants us to have true gift of love to him from us. And that requires free will, which also means that we're going to do bad things sometimes, right? So that's a it, that's a fundamental part of our faith because you know there's other religions that don't have that kind of same kind of respect for free will, but we do. So, but yeah, so he's saying very clearly, we're free, right? We have this freedom that comes from our faith in Christ, and now they're trying to enslave us, right? They're trying to to take us back into this kind of mentality in which we don't have that freedom. We are under the kind of the um, sort of restrictions that are going to allow us then to seek salvation. It's like, no, salvation is not about that. It's about simply life in Christ. And also the point you made too, how they slipped in, right? Under secret, under secrecy, probably in the nighttime. So even there, he's trying to kind of color these Judaizers, these people that they're, you know, they're kind of, they don't have the best intentions. So he says in verse five, to them, we did not submit even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain intact for you. So again, he's saying there's one gospel. Remember we talked about this last time. There's not multiple gospels, like there's one gospel that I have preached to you. And we are going to maintain intact the truth of that one gospel as against, you know, these people who are trying to add something to it or subvert it or whatever it might be. How about we have somebody read verse, um, we'll do six. Yeah, verse six. Just six. Yes. And from those who were reputed to be something, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who were of repute added nothing to me. This is a great, this is a very Pauline. We're starting to get a little bit more of his voice here in that little, it might be in parentheses for you. What they, what they once were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. So he's talking, when he talks about men of repute, who is he talking about? He's talking about the powers that be, right? The apostles like Peter and, and John and James. And, and he's saying, oh yeah, the ones who were of repute, you know, but then he says in this kind of aside, oh, but it doesn't make any difference to me if they were men of repute or whoever they are. Basically he's saying, it, it, it doesn't really matter who they are to me, you know, uh, I know the truth of the gospel that has been given to me. And they didn't make me add anything. 
meaning he presented to them the gospel he was preaching to the Gentiles. And they said, OK, looks great. We're not going to make you add anything. We're not going to say, oh, you have to add the Jewish law. You have to do this or that. They said the, the gospel you preach is, is good. You know, um, so he's basically trying to tell them there was this agreement from the beginning that this this gospel was correct. This gospel was OK. And this was the gospel, the only gospel. And then how about we do, how about we have somebody read seven through uh, 10? Go ahead, yeah. But on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for the mission to the circumcised worked through me also for the Gentiles. And when they perceived the grace that was given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised. Only they would have us remember the poor, which very thing I was eager to do. So this, these verses are essentially a summary of what we refer to as, again, the Council of Jerusalem. So the apostles come together, the first followers of Jesus, Paul, Peter, James, John, they come together in Jerusalem to make some decisions about how things are going to move forward. And the big issue, again, is this issue of what are we going to do about the Jewish law? And what is Paul saying here? That we came to this agreement, again, that the gospel I preach, the gospel they preach is one and the same. And it doesn't require the imposition of all of the restrictions of the Jewish law. Something very important here in verses, uh, verse 7, um, Paul have you ever heard of this, referred to this way, Paul as the apostle to the uncircumcised and Peter to the circumcised? Obviously, we don't want to use the word circumcision, so we can say, you might have heard this, Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, right? And Peter as the apostle to, generally speaking, Israel, meaning the Jewish people. So this is a very uh, common way of referring to Peter and Paul. We talked last time how they are the princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul. So Peter being the one who is given authority over all the 12 apostles in Matthew 16. We kind of regard him as the first pope then for that reason, right? He's the head of the apostles. So Peter's the head of the 12. But then Paul, right, he wasn't one of the 12 originally, but he had this amazing encounter with Jesus, this revelation, as we talked about, that put him on a par really with the apostles in general, but also really with, with Peter. And so this is where you can see that there's going to be a little bit of a, you know, because you have the 12 with their leader already, Peter, and then this guy Paul comes in from, you know, he's been preaching for 20 years up in Syria, and he comes down and he says, oh, well, I'm basically on the same level. Jesus appeared to me. Yeah. I was thinking, though, of Paul still is very humble because he, he goes, that was his reason for going. It says right here, lest somehow I should be running or had run in vain. So he, he wanted that cohesion. He wanted that unity. He didn't want to be running off like a lone wolf. Exactly. Yes, he was very much humble. And also because, to build off what you're saying, right, as we saw in verse 2 of chapter 2, he goes in accord with Revelation, meaning it was revealed to him. And he had the humility to say, you know, God appears to him and says, you need to go down and you've got to, you know, check and see what the others are doing. Come to an agreement on this. Not that you're doing anything wrong necessarily, but you want to make sure that there is cohesion among. And he listens. You know, how many people might have heard that and said, oh, that's fine. I'm just doing I'm doing what I need to do. I'm fine. I'm good. You know, but to submit, there's a certain amount of, of vulnerability in submitting to, you know, he is very firm in what he believes, which is true. He's very firm in, in what he did is right and OK and, and true. But also there's a vulnerability to go and to say, this is what I've been doing and to kind of check up and see what what the others think, especially those kept in authority. So that's very true. It reminds me of, you know. Uh, Paul's famous line about, you know, he had he had a thorn in his side given to him because when he became whenever he became puffed up, it was that thorn in his side that reminded him of who he is. Right. So we all have that. You know, we all have delusions of grandeur and prideful moments. Right. And we need to be reminded, like, I'm not the end all and be all right. I'm just I'm a sinful, prideful human being. So so it's good to keep our mindset on the because this letter is going to give us a, the side of Paul that's much more kind of firm and and you know, vehement in certain senses, but he is a man of humility. He's a man of spirituality and mysticism as well. So that's kind of the two. So Peter, you know, so we understand now Paul is this apostle to those who are not from the Jewish people, right? All the nations throughout the world, Galatians, Thessalonians, all that. Whereas Peter is understood to be 
he was a leader in the Jerusalem church originally, um, then later in Antioch and then obviously in Rome. But he was considered to be really an apostle to the Jewish people in a, in a, in a major sense. So they kind of came to this understanding. OK, you're going to have authority in a certain sense over the, the apostles that are going to the Jewish people. And Paul is going to have authority to those who are going to Gentiles. So they came to this one little agreement and they had this. Um, I like this line here. This is a very famous, famous line here. Um, verse nine. So James, Cephas, and John, the pillars of the early church there in Jerusalem. So that's Cephas meaning Peter, right? Peter, the apostle, Simon Peter. John, John, the apostle. James is mostly understood to be James the lesser. So not James the greater, but James the lesser. So three of the 12 apostles, the pillars of the church, they come together and they gave me and Barnabas, so Paul and Barnabas, their right hands in partnership. It's called like a hand clasp. That was an ancient way of showing basically that you come to an agreement. They, they clasp their hands. There's famous images of this all over, especially in Rome. If you go all over, there's paintings of this, this where they all kind of, you know, it's kind of like what guys do now with kind of the hand clasp and everything, but it had much more meaning than it was basically, we've come to an agreement. What was the agreement again? He's basically saying the Council of Jerusalem, we came to the agreement that we, we each sort of have our own jurisdictions in a certain sense, and we're not going to, we're both preaching the gospel correctly. We don't need to impose the Jewish law on Gentiles or, you know, Everything up to this point has been basically done correctly. Um, and what is the last thing here? Verse 10. This is so important. It seems like it's totally unrelated. But so the Council of Jerusalem, the first major matter in the church that they have to come to is about the Jewish law. And what is the only other thing that we have notation of that they said every Christian? It, it, basically, what they're saying is if we do have to add anything to what we're preaching or if we do have to emphasize anything more in our preaching, it's. That's so amazing. Think about that for a second. That they, you know, they're coming together for the first time, really, all you know, pretty much all the apostles at that point. I mean, there's others that are scattered throughout the world that couldn't be there. But the major apostles that are in kind of the, you know, this this kind of Middle East general area come together in Jerusalem really to discuss primarily this idea of, you know, what's going to happen with Jewish law. But they're like, we need to make very clear that we have to redouble our efforts in terms of being mindful of the poor. What does this tell us that from the very earliest days, Christians have always been, following the words of Jesus, had a special care for the poor. And that they've been countercultural, because in that world, if you were poor, it, it, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You weren't even part of society. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear stories throughout the Bible of a beggar on the side of the road calling out to Jesus or a blind man. Those people were disposable mm -hmm. in that culture. Mm -hmm. And so for, for the people that preach the gospel to make it a point to mm -hmm. say, oh, no, it's our responsibility yeah. to take care of them. Yeah. It really, it must have been, I would think it was shocking mm -hmm. in that world because that was just how life was, you know, yeah. someone was blind or poor. And they mm -hmm. just go to that, you mm -hmm. know. Especially because they make such particular, you know, uh, mention of it. It leads us to believe that it wasn't something that was being practiced generally in the world or in the in the church, yes, but in the world. So you know, because they wouldn't, if people were caring for them, if there were other things for them, they wouldn't necessarily have to say, "Oh, no, we need to care for the poor." But like you're saying, you know, they have to make special mention because apparently this wasn't really happening, right, throughout the empire. And so the Christians were known for their care for the poor. That's what we have to be today, too. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that in the first chapter. Paul makes it clear in multiple ways that everything that he's teaching has been revealed to him by God. So he didn't go to the apostles and learn it or anywhere else. God gave this revelation, it's not from man, it's from God. And but in this next chapter, he's also acknowledging that there is a human authority and hierarchy in the church, and that you you know, because we look at the Protestant revolt and how suddenly it's well, God is telling me these things, so I don't need to listen to the church. But Paul in no way is saying that, yes, he has this revelation, but he's also acknowledging that there's this established hierarchy and we're working together and that I also have authority given to me by these apostles, mm -hmm. these men that God chose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. And that's all here. I mean, people say that that's, you know, what you're talking about in terms of church leadership and all that, that, oh, that comes later. That's a perversion of the gospel. It's all right here. And and we understand that Paul would have, you know, he doesn't question that kind of like just going back to the point about humility. Right. He doesn't question that. You know, it's not as if he thinks, oh, this revelation comes to me and now I'm just a lone wolf. I can do what I want. I don't have to. No, he realizes, no, 
God has chosen these individuals to have this authority of the church. And therefore, my ministry has to be cohesive with theirs. If it's not, then there's two churches, there's two gospels, right? Then, then that's possible, right? So there's this understanding from the very beginning that there has to be this authority structure. And also that they this is, you know, where the church gets this whole idea of, you know, what we call ecumenical councils, right? The first one not being until the year 325. So, you know, long time after this, centuries after this. But that whole idea of everyone coming together to discuss important matters and to come to a decision under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This was already happening. We understand this to be around the year 50 or so AD. So again, just in the last, you know, years from, from when Jesus, you know, rose and ascended to heaven, already they're gathering together. There's an authority structure in the church. There's a council. All of this is from the earliest days. It's all from the scriptures. Yeah. And, and he's reinforcing in verse eight that what Peter's doing for the circumcised, I'm doing for the Gentiles, but it's the same person working through both of yes. us yeah. to deliver the gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I have this gospel for the Gentiles and mm -hmm. Peter has this gospel for the Jews. It's Jesus Christ is working through both of us. Mm -hmm. To deliver our message exactly to whom we've been called to deliver it to. Mm -hmm. and like he says too in verse nine it's a grace bestowed upon me as it was opposed to the others again like just reiterating this language of it's not something that i chose it's something that came to me right it was given to me and therefore i have this authority based on that not on my own kind of merits or anything like that but i think i just think that verse 10 is so powerful right that they they were told to be mindful of the poor this comes up a lot actually in you know, usually when you're reading this passage, you're thinking about the issues of like, you know, whatever the Jewish law and circumcision, but this kind of sticks out in the middle. And and many times it's used just that verse even to remind us about how much we need to as Christians be <clears throat> mindful of the poor in a countercultural way, especially when we're in contexts where <clears throat> the poor are not being cared for in the way they should be. So that's the Council of Jerusalem. So again, what is the Council of Jerusalem? We understand it to be right around the year 50 AD. It's where the church comes together for the first time to really discuss this matter of what are we doing about the Jewish law? Because Jesus doesn't explicitly tell us, you know, he says he comes to fulfill the law, right? He says he comes not to take away a jot or a tittle of the law, right? To fulfill the law. But what does that mean for the Christian? That's what they're trying to understand is how does that apply in our lives? Does it mean that we have to then follow the law? Does it mean we don't? So they come to this agreement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But then verse 11 your 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 title there might read something like mine reads Peter's inconsistency at Antioch. Does that, anybody have other like title lines? Paul rebukes. Paul rebukes. Paul rebukes Peter. Okay, so a little bit of an altercation comes in. Before we even read this, some of us probably already know what's happening here, but can we kind of see maybe where this is going, where things are maybe going to break down between them? Does anybody have any any? You might have already again. You probably already are familiar with the story, but. We've this is we set the stage. Everything seems great, and that's what Paul's kind of doing. He's like, everything seems great. You know, we come up to this agreement. Everything's fine. You know, one to the circumcised, other to the uncircumcised. We came to this agreement, but then things are going to break down. What could be going on here? Well, I think part of it is that just like today, you might know what a truth is, but we we fear the crowd that's going to cancel us or whatever kind of things are going to happen, and Peter had already agreed with Paul at the Council of Jerusalem. And all of a sudden now he's saying, oh, wait, you know, these Judaizers are saying we need to do this. So, yeah, we need to do this. So he's kind of, you know, succumbing to that human respect as opposed to what the authority of God. Exactly. Human respect comes in. That's a great word. What does that refer to in the Catholic Church? And what do we mean when we say human respect? Because it seems like it's a good thing. Like, don't we want human respect? But when we say human respect in a Christian context, it means when we are seeking out the respect and the praise and the acclaim of the world of humanity in situations where that's opposed to what God respects, right? Where the apostles say in the Acts of the Apostles, right? We 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 are called to obey God rather than man. It doesn't mean we can never obey man, right? A lot of times we have to and we should. Um, but when those are in you know not in accord, right? When when man is commanding us to do something that God has commanded us not to do, then you know, of course, we have to obey God rather than man. And if we ended up obeying man rather than God, then we're seeking out this human respect, this human acclaim over what the truth is. And that is really the heart of the matter here. So why don't we um, let's just read that whole thing. So why don't we read somebody read verse 11 through 14. 
Anybody? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. And when Phoebus came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he clearly was wrong. For until some people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to draw back and separated himself because he was afraid of the circumcised. And the rest of the Jews also acted hypocritically along with him, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not on the right road in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all, if you, though Jew, are living like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Great. So what's happening here to kind of sum up what this, what this event is? Again, a very famous uh, situation in the scriptures where there is this very public, as Paul says many times here, very public uh, altercation between Peter and Paul. So what's happening here? Again, these are the two princes of the apostles. They just come to this agreement, right? They each have their own kind of separate jurisdictions in a sense. They've made an agreement about the Jewish law. Then Peter, Cephas, as he referred to, he goes up to Antioch, which Antioch is up in Syria, so north of Jerusalem. So he goes up there to kind of see what's going on. We know that this was a major center of Christianity in the early days. It's the first place where Christians were referred to as Christians, according to the Acts of the Apostles. It was a major center, especially of uh, Christians coming from a non-Jewish background, so Gentile Christianity in a, in a major way. So Peter goes up there, and everything comes down to this topic of table fellowship, meaning when you're eating at table, what kind of restrictions are going to follow, right? Are you going to follow the Jewish dietary restrictions? Are you not going to? And what happens is, and so for, where are we at? Verse 12. So Peter used to eat with the Gentiles, and that was no issue for him, meaning it was okay for him to eat with people who weren't following the Jewish dietary laws until some people came from James, who was James, member. James from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem church. Some people come up from Jerusalem and they see him and he's eating with Gentiles. He doesn't seem to be caring about the Jewish dietary laws. And then gets a little bit nervous and he separated himself from their table fellowship, right? Again, all around this topic of the Jewish dietary restrictions. So initially he's following the, the prescriptions of their agreement, which is basically, I'm not going to, uh, you know, care if others see me, you know, dining with others who don't follow those restrictions. But then when there's some of these people come in and see what's going on, he backs away. And we would say out of a certain sense of human respect, right? Because he sees these people that probably friends of his that he knew from Jerusalem that are now seeing him, oh, what's going on? You know, um, but ultimately he, he backs away. And Paul very, you know, he says, I oppose him to his face because he was clearly wrong. I like that line. So he comes right up to him and says, and this is a line here in verse 14. If you, though a Jew, are living like a Gentile, meaning if you're a Jew, but you're not following the Jewish dietary restriction laws, how can you then compel Gentiles to live according to the Jewish dietary restriction laws, right? So it's kind of this, this element of hypocrisy that's there, is what he's claiming. So ultimately, it comes down to this thing of, of, of human respect. Um, two things I want to just propose from this passage that are important to reflect on that hopefully I, I imagine you all would have um, ideas and, and com comments and concerns about and things. So the first one would be, it always seems a little bit controversial, a little bit scandalous, right? Because we're talking about St. Peter, who is not only an apostle, but he is the head of the church, the early church. So people say, oh, isn't it bad that he was, he's sinning? You know, how could that be? Yeah. That's crazy, right? We kind of talked about this last week, right, with Peter. There's a special, do you want to talk about actually that? Maybe the the special, the the tradition with Peter in Rome about, because, because again, what I'm trying to point out here is we always think, okay, the apostles and the saints, oh, they could never sin. They could never do anything wrong. And if they do, it's terrible. There's a, there's a, a tradition about when Peter later in his life um, was in Rome serving as basically the first Pope. Did you want to talk about no, that? You're in okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had this great, we had a great discussion two weeks ago about this. There's a, there's a special tradition that's held in Rome. It's not in the scripture or anything like that. But there's a tradition that when when Peter again after this, after Peter's in Rome, he's leading the early church, and persecutions are beginning. Obviously, we know Peter was ultimately killed. He was crucified upside down. Obviously, Paul was beheaded in Rome in the early 60s, like right around 62 A.D. So persecutions were heating up, and for some reason, we don't know exactly the reason, there's different explanations given, 
Peter actually says, I had enough. And he starts leaving Rome. And Jesus appears to him as he's leaving Rome, appears to him like he did St. Saint, Saint Paul. And you can still go to the spot in, in outside of Rome where that happened. There's a church on the site now. You can go see the rock where Jesus appeared on. Um, and Jesus appears to him and says, quo vadis in Latin, which means, where are you going? And basically, basically what he's saying by that is, turn around and get back, you know? And then he, he goes back and he ends, up being, he ends up being killed. So this is another moment where we have Peter, right? The, the same person who denied Christ three times, right? The same person who kind of backed away from the table fellowship because of, out of a little bit of human respect. The same person who then starts to leave Rome and basically gives up the papacy, essentially. Um, so what do we say with all that? Well, it's some people think, oh, that's kind of scandalous that he could be sinning. On. No, it's a great sort of, I think, consoling thing. It's that, you know, we're all sinners, right? Even the greatest among us doesn't mean we're not going to at times fall into sin because especially, again, to the one who a lot is given, even more is expected, right? So when you're given this amazing authority, there's going to be a lot of things on your plate and you might fall sometimes. But what's the important thing is you always turn back as Peter did. Yes. And, and you know, on the flip side of that, um, people might say, well, it's, it's scandalous if you can imagine if the Holy Father could sin, right? You can have mm. a church and, you know, um, but at the same time, we, you know, here we have Paul who is publicly calling him out. And we had that today where we have, you know, the dubia and the, the cardinals who call out the confusion by mm -hmm. some of the comments from our Holy Father. And people say, well, that's so can't, you know, he's the, he's the Pope, you know, he's being led by the Spirit. How could you call him out, right? And I think the important thing is that we all need to, we all have times in our lives when we need correction, no matter yeah. who we are within the church, we need correction. But we correct while we, with respect and staying within the church. Yes. Paul would have never said, oh my gosh, Peter's screwed up. I need to start my own church. It's like, a great point. Chair of Peter is vacant. I'm going to start my own church. He would have never done that. He would have called them out and he would have still stayed true to the gospel and true to the church, which was established by Jesus Christ. And that, yeah. that's what we're called to today. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Paul doesn't go when he sees this happening, even though he's obviously very angry, as he's very clear to say, he doesn't say, oh, I'm going to go now up to the Gentiles in the Thessalonica or in Galatia. I'm just going to make my own church and I don't want to have to deal with you because you're totally off base. No, he because he knows that the church is one. And so he knows that even though there's this discord here, we have to get to unity. Right. And there is a unity that exists still, obviously, but we have to get to that fuller unity. And that is the challenge, not, okay, let me go do my own thing. We can't get to the unity if we don't acknowledge that there's discord in the first place. Yes. And it's okay, as you said, to, I mean, I think this is one of the major reasons that this is in the scriptures. I mean, the fact that this is, you know, we have this account, which again, seems very much uh, scandalous to some. Like, the reason that this is in the scriptures is to remind us that this is something that we are called to do, right? There are going to be times where there is actually um, discord in the church, even at high levels. And it's not something that we haven't experienced before is basically what we're saying, right? From the earliest days, this happened. And how did they get through it? As we're going to see by, first of all, by pointing it out. And then again, this, this, this challenge, this obligation to find that common ground, to find that unity in the midst of that division and to seek out correction too, when it's needed. So that's the first thing I want. The second thing to kind of reflect on is just this whole idea, which you could you could pray a whole week, a holy hour on this whole thing about human respect, which I think is a huge, huge. We've talked about this before, a huge challenge for us in this day and age. Right. Because it's always is. But especially in a world today that, do, you know, doesn't agree. They agree with us on some things. Right. The lovey dovey, nice stuff. But they don't agree with us on some of the harder things. Right. And so it's easy to kind of just fall into oh, what's going to please people and what's going to get human respect rather than time we have to really proclaim things about our faith, about what we believe that are not the most attractive, let's say, to the world around us. So I think human respect is a huge obstacle to um, for all of us, myself included. I'm the first one that's saying that in front of all of you. So, um, But this is, again, I mean, if, if we find ourselves at a point where we feel like this is an issue for us, human respect, what can we say? Well, St. Peter found himself there too. And actually he, you know, publicly did something. He wasn't just, you know, struggling with the human respect. He actually publicly did something that kind of, you know, basically publicly sinned um, in a way that was under the sway of human respect. So we're not alone if we're feeling that way. 
Um, and it's, and we're certainly not in any way abandoned. We can, we can move back to the Lord like, like Peter did. So, but I think this is, those are two things I would say to, you know, if you pray on this passage that you reflect on is the first would be, like we just talked about, this is a reality that there is going to be division and discord in the church. How do we respond to that? Right. How do we respond to that in the right way, which is what they do here. And second of all, human respect is a huge, you know, sort of obstacle to our life and faith. How am I falling victim to that? And how do I need to, um, like Peter, turn back to the Lord in those moments? Because it's going to happen to all of us, right? It could be as small as like, you know, you're in a conversation and somebody's talking about, and you just don't want to go there because, oh, it's going to it's gonna ruffle feathers or, you know, um, I'm going to look bad or, oh, I'll just, you know, you know, stay quiet or whatever. And maybe the Lord is calling you to, you know, say something, right? Um, so, but again, I'm the first one to, to blame for that, so... <laughs> So we're right up about time. Um, now, this next passage, if you want to take a look at it for in preparation for next week, this passage, verse 15 through 21, very difficult passage. OK, so everything we kind of just what we did today was kind of the historical narrative. We went through Council of Jerusalem. We went through Peter's inconsistency. It's a historical narrative, so it's a little bit easier to kind of figure out what's going on. 15 through 21, Paul is going to get into um, he starts to kind of talk theologically. And he does so in this is very like sort of typical of Paul, right? He speaks in these sentences that there's so much jam packed into each one. And he's not really trying to take you through so much of what he's saying. He's just kind of putting out there his ideas, sentence after sentence. And so they really take, you know, um, takes not only time to read them and to reflect on them, but also hopefully if you have a Bible that has, you know, footnotes and things like that, that can help kind of read through what he's saying. Because this is where he gets into Again, some of the theology, and this is actually the meat of what the letter is going to be about. I just want to talk later, which is this whole thing, which you've heard of before in Christianity, faith versus works. Okay, here he's particularly talking about works of the law, meaning works that are commanded by the law, the Jewish law, um, as opposed to faith in Christ and that kind of very misunderstood topic among Christians today, what that means, right? So we're going to talk about that next time. So if you want to already kind of jumpstart a little bit, and especially because then it'll help you understand a little better next time, um, kind of just start to read through that. And if you do have a Bible that has footnotes, or if you have a, another kind of commentary source to kind of work through with that. And that's going to take us into the heart of the letter theologically, which basically continues through, you see chapter three, um, which tells us all about, again, this the central part of this letter. So wonderful. So we'll conclude. Any final thoughts or reflections? We'll conclude with a prayer. But Angelus is meeting, I think, today, right after. So um, happy uh, All Saints Day. Um, maybe we can pray in a special way. So we remember that, you know, all these per people were talking about Barnabas, Titus, Timothy, Paul, Peter. You know, maybe they had their altercations and their misunderstandings in their life during the lifetime. But they're all saints today, which means they're all right now. They're all in the communion of saints together in glory. Didn't matter what kind of, you know, what kind of things that they disagreed on in their life. Didn't matter even the sins that they committed because they returned to the mercy of God and repented of them. Right. They're in heaven. And so they can pray for us today. It's also kind of a nice witness to us that, you know, we're going to be, you know, as people in our even our own parish community, like we're going to get into, you know, things with with each other. If we're doing the ministry right, sometimes it's going to happen. Sometimes we are have to correct somebody. Sometimes we're going to do this or that. We're going to sin. But the goal is that we would all be together in heaven. And there won't be any, any more, any kind of, um, any challenge, any temptation, anything. We'll just be in glory with the saints. So we pray for them, especially those saints. Um, even you can pray in your own reflection on the scriptures, right? You can pray for the intercession of St. Timothy, St. Titus, St. Paul, to help you to come to a greater understanding of these passages because they themselves were involved in them too and involved in these same issues. So let's pray for their intercession in a special way in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we turn to you this day on this solemnity of all saints. We give thanks for the gift of all of the saints, the heavenly hosts that watches over us, the angels and saints in heaven who watch over us and with their special intercession, remind us of the Lord's providential care for each one of us. We pray in a special way for the powerful intercession of Saints Peter and St. Paul, St. James, St. John, St. Timothy, St. Titus, St. Barnabas, all of the holy apostles and disciples who in the earliest days of the church we're responsible for maintaining the truths of the gospel and bringing them to all peoples. We ask that you would, in the same way, through their intercession, inspire us to bring that one gospel, the truth of that one gospel, to the peoples of our world. 
help us to overcome the obstacles of, of human respect, of scandal, of misunderstanding, of pride, of prejudice, of resentment, of, of greed and grievance, all these obstacles that get in our way and keep us from knowing you and also keep us from doing our mission, which is again, to share that gospel with all people. So we pray, Lord, that you might strengthen us in this mission that we have here in our city. We ask this in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank Good you. to be with you all once again. Sorry again that I was a little late, but duty calls. Larry saved. Yes, I. That's why it's great oh, to have. Good opening act. I'm not the man. <laughs>